God used to dwell in a house among his people. But now he has a home that's better than the first. It doesn't look like a building with a steeple. Now he's living in the people of the church. Brick after brick, God is building his temple. Brick after brick, he's making it strong. With Christ the sure foundation and his people as the stones, he is building a place he can live. Brick after brick. Today we're going to be taking a lesson from John 4, 24, in Spirit and Truth. Very familiar story uh, about the woman at the well. We're actually going to pick it up at the end of that story. We're going to be talking about the worshipful life. Um, you notice one of the songs was, Here I Am to Worship. Uh, is that our attitude on a daily basis? Are we ready to worship? I want to talk about that today. That very familiar story, just for a little geographical information here, a little town called Sychar, the location on the map Somewhere near what was known as Jacob's Well and Mount Gerizim is approximate. Sychar doesn't exist anymore, so that's kind of a guess at where it probably was. The two important geographical locations here are Mount Gerizim, where Samaritans worshipped, and Jerusalem for the Jews. So this is where this takes place. And using the net translation today, toward the end of that story, it says, The woman said to him, speaking to Jesus, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you people, referring to the Jews, say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You people worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. So the key to what he's basically saying here is, you worship what you don't know. But the Jews, God's chosen people, do know. He's basically saying, you have no idea what you're talking about. You have no idea what you're doing. Why is that? So let's talk about the Samaritans a little bit. They were left behind during the Assyrian exile. As Rev has mentioned a few times, when another culture will come in like that, they'll leave some people behind, take out the important ones, the leadership, and then sort of mix and mingle the cultures and sort of work their way in that way. These folks would have been there and left behind during the exile. So as a result, they intermarried with the Assyrians. So now their offspring are half Gentile. So there's still somewhat of a Jewish background, but you also have the pagan influence from the Assyrians. As a result, they displayed a lot of ignorance and inaccuracy in their beliefs, which is why Jesus says, you don't have this right at all. They even chose a different place for their center of worship. No longer the temple in Jerusalem, it's now their own temple in Mount Gerizim. But Jesus says, this is not going to be the case for long. He says, the time is coming and now is here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeks such people to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and the people who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So, the time is coming and now is here. So, sort of an already but not yet kind of a thing when there will really be true worshipers, worshiping the correct way. What does he mean by that? Well, for one thing, before long, both those locations are going to be laid to waste by invaders. So there won't be either place to worship. The already here part is that the kingdom of God, as Jesus himself said, the kingdom of God is at hand. What do you mean by that? I am here. I am the kingdom of God. So people are going to need to make the distinction about how to properly worship God, and that's who the Father's looking for not anybody else who doesn't know what they're talking about. He wants to know he has true worshipers to follow him. So it brings us to our key verse. God is spirit, and the people who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. It's kind of interesting that they refer to God specifically this way to say that he's spirit. Why, why did Jesus say that? Charles Ellicott uh, said this many years ago. And this is a pretty good explanation. It says, The appeal is here made to a doctrine of special prominence in the Samaritan theology. Remember, we were saying they had, the, they had it all wrong. They had altered a number of passages in the Pentateuch, which is just another term for the first five books of the Bible, which seemed to them to speak of God in language properly applicable to man and to ascribe to him human form and feelings. 
but to believe in the spiritual essence of God contained its own answer, both as to place and mode of worship. The way the Samaritans had this completely misunderstood what and who and why and how it's supposed to worship. So addressing, it's kind of interesting, by the way, isn't it, that um, especially with the culture at the time, the relationship between men and women, the relationship between Jews and Samaritans, which there really wasn't one, is that uh, the woman felt pretty free to talk to Jesus. And, and that whole circumstance was kind of interesting because most of the time, the women would go together to get water when it was cool. This woman's by herself out in the heat of the day, as is Jesus. So perhaps she was a bit of an outcast herself. She certainly wasn't shy about speaking to him, and she continues here. She said, the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, the one called Christ. Whenever he comes, he will tell us everything. Jesus said to her, I, the one speaking to you, am he. He's like, here's the point. You think you've got this all figured out, but you don't. I'm right here talking to you. I'm the answer. Not religious formalities, not rituals, not traditions or locations but a direct relationship with God himself. And that kind of proved to be a problem. From what we know, we would think, we're like, wow, that's finally what we need. That's what we want. But in truth, it's not what people want, not by nature. Let's flip forward to Acts 15. But some from the religious party of the Pharisees who had believed stood up and said, it is necessary to circumcise the Gentiles and to order them to observe the law of Moses. Weren't you listening? Apparently not. In verses 10 and 11, Peter responds and says, Why are you putting God to the test by placing on the neck of the disciples a yoke that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear? What was the biggest proof of the law? That we can't obey it. On the contrary, we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they are. Why are you still doing this? You've been freed from all of that. You don't need to do it anymore. In Galatians, Paul Paul says, you're observing religious days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that my work for you may have been in vain. Weren't you listening? Apparently not. It's human nature. Worshippers have continued to insist on trying to do these things to this day. We're not happy unless we're coming up with some sort of an obligation, some sort of a requirement or a regulation or a rule to follow creating whole denominations, totally not biblical, hierarchies, disagreements among all those, making a lot out of people instead of God, trying to set up a whole set of rules and regulations where, because people like that. We want someone to say, here it is. One, two, three, four, you're all set. As long as you can do that. Which misses the point entirely. Some examples. Took this from, uh, these are a few exemptions, a few examples, excuse me, um, of a section that was basically how you be the a minimum standard for being considered like an active Catholic. And I, boy, I remember these. You shall attend Mass on Sundays and on holy days of obligation and rest from servile labor. You shall receive the sacrament of the Eucharist at least during the Easter season. And you shall observe the days of fasting and abstinence established by the church. Any of you who have a Catholic background like I did, there is an entire year's schedule planned out. You do this on this day, that on that day. The preacher generally, the priest usually knows there's, there's something he's scheduled to preach on that day. You know, the, not the exact words, but certainly that topic. At least that's how it used to be years ago. That might be different now. And for the time when they can't think of anything to call it or don't, don't have any specific program in place, or whatever they call that ordinary time. I remember speaking to some Catholic friends a while back, not long after I uh, joined the last church I went to, and they said, so, you know, what about this kind of thing? Or do you have, like, different time, like ordinary time, stuff like that? I'm like, it's all ordinary time. It's all, it's all the same. It's all about Jesus. It's not about the calendar. So, but when you get used to, and I, I, you know, I remember that feeling when you're used to that kind of structure, it, it get, and the thing is, not only do you get comfortable with it, but it gets in your way. I left the Catholic Church because I felt like whatever's going on here, this can't be right. Well, I'm worshiping as the church. It's not, you know, nothing to do with God. This just doesn't seem to fit. Of course, as, as an unsaved person at the time, in spite of years of Catholicism, I, I, 
you know, this just wasn't making it for me. And when I was looking around trying to figure out where I belong spiritually, one of the first things I said was, I'm going to get away from something that's got all these ridiculous rules and regulations. Of course, I was still going about it the wrong way, speaking to the Samaritans, right? Why wasn't I looking for Christ? Why wasn't I really trying to seek? In, in my half-hearted way, I was trying to seek God, but apparently I wasn't, wasn't doing a great job of it, although he was apparently guiding me where I needed to go. I don't, I don't want to belabor that point too much, but it, it's our natural... It's funny because we naturally gravitate toward all these rules and regulations until we can't stand them anymore. But then what do we do next? Well, we find a, a different set <laughs> to follow. Here's something from uh, Adventist.org. The fourth commandment of God's unchangeable law requires the observance of the seventh-day Sabbath as the day of rest, worship, and ministry in harmony with the teaching and practice of Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath. Hold on to that phrase. Joyful observance of this holy time from evening to evening, sunset to sunset, is a celebration of God's creative and redemptive acts. Well, they just said, Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath. Well, it says in Mark 2, 27 and 28, then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for people, not people for the Sabbath. For this reason, the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Were they listening? Guess not. It's, it's kind of interesting, all these, these rules and regulations and things, and how when you take your faith, so the, the, people tend to go two ways. They'll either really take it seriously and go insane trying to follow it, or they just throw it all out the window and do whatever they want. Of course, either way, you're in bad shape. And then you have, I met someone once, um, we were talking about um, faith and everything, and I, had, well, I was kind of newly saved, and, and we, she was telling me that she was a Catholic. I said, oh, okay, yeah, I was Catholic for a long time. She says, yeah, I'm kind of a PNC Catholic. I said, all, all those years I never heard of that. What does that mean? She said, oh, pick and choose. She picks out the things that she could manage to, to go along with and uh, discarded the rest. Now, that wasn't that she didn't care or have any respect for the church. It was, it was how she managed to get by on a daily basis. A friend of mine who still to this day takes the Catholic faith very seriously, and I'm convinced I'll see her in heaven. I said, well, you know, not easy being Catholic, is it? She says, boy, it sure isn't. We make it hard for ourselves. We distract ourselves from what's important. The Westminster Shorter Catechism from 1648 says, what is the chief end of man? Why are we here? What's our purpose? Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Seems like a simple enough concept. We are here to worship. All kinds of books have been written about worship. How to do it. How to praise God. How to pray to God. How to, why, it's interesting that we should have a book that says why worship in the first place. I guess we have a bigger problem than I thought. So these kind of things get in the way of the worshipful life. There are other things that get in the way of the worshipful life as well. So what are some of these things that get in our way? how we trip over our own feet. There's no denying that we live stressful lives. Stress of work, stress of family, stress of all kinds of problems can distract us, take us away. The times when we should focus on God the most, it tends to pull us away. Illness. Everything's harder when you're sick. Everything's harder when you're in pain. It's easy for people to say, You'll be fine. It'll be okay. Well, they're not the ones going through it. So even though they're right, and you hang in there with God, and one way or another, things are going to turn out the way they're supposed to, and is this going to be okay? It, that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to instantly feel better. It doesn't mean it's not going to be hard. And it doesn't mean it's not going to be even harder after you've told them it's going to be okay. It's hard sometimes to reach closer to the cloak of Jesus when you're sick and when you're in pain. Because you might tend to say, well, where are you then? Although hopefully deep down inside, you know he's there. We're distracted. I have never seen in my entire life a time when it's easier to be distracted from anything faith-based, faith-related as it is now. Everything that comes at us every day, all day long. All the busyness, all the media, all the political arguments, all the religious disputes, all the, all the things that are, all the materialistic 
existence. I mean, there, there are so many things in our lives, there is so much going on on a daily basis, you have to make a conscious choice to say, I have to stop and put time aside to do this, to think about this. Or before you know it, the intention at 8 o'clock in the morning, it's now 8 o'clock in the evening, and you, you realize you hadn't thought about God all day. Exhaustion. Just like everything's harder when you're sick and in pain, everything's harder when you're worn out from all of these other things that I just mentioned. When you're tired, when you're kind of at the end of your rope, it's hard to think about worship and prayer and reading your Bible and how you might serve someone else in the body of Christ or some one of your neighbors. Or, but that's actually what you ought to be thinking about. It's not the easiest thing to do, though. All you can think about is, I just want to make it all go away and go to bed. So after all of those things, what you end up is, with is discouragement. It's very easy to get in a situation where you have prayerless prayers, praiseless praise, and faithless faith. There just doesn't seem to be anything to it anymore. Now, getting back to our main topic here, a particular danger here, a church in Ephesus, Revelation, says, To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil. You're going after it, you're fighting the good fight. They have tested themselves who call themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. Rooting them out. Okay. I know you're enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake and you've not grown weary. Haven't given up. But I have this against you. You've departed from your first love. Therefore, remember from what high state you have fallen and repent. What's being done that's wrong that needs to be corrected? What's being said that's wrong that needs to be corrected? All these things have to come after your focus on Christ first. Don't get so wrapped up in all of the, these types of things that you forget about God. You've departed from your first love, therefore remember from what high state you have fallen and repent. He's saying you were doing so well. You're not only worshiping me and being faithful to me, but you're making sure, you're trying to make sure that everything gets done that needs to be done, everything that needs to be corrected, fixed, whatever gets handled. You're trying to address all the problems, but you forgot about me in the meantime. That's a mistake that actually requires repentance. What they forgot is worship must be our daily motivation and our practice. These two things go together. If you're motivated daily to worship God, and that's how you see everything in your life, then there's your daily practice. And as now, as it's a daily practice, what does that do? Something you do every day is more of a habit. It's something you want to do every day. So now... You're getting self-motivated to look at your life that way. To get up in the morning and think, how can I serve God today? Why? Because you did it yesterday, and you did it the day before. However successful you manage to be, at least start out that way out of the gate. If you're partway through your day and you realize you haven't been motivated by that, then that's time to stop for a minute and reset and think about that and say, Where's my daily motivation for worship? Where's my daily worship today? How do I do that today? Listen to this from Isaiah 29. The Lord says, These people say they are loyal to me. They say wonderful things about me, but they're not really loyal to me. Their worship consists of nothing but man-made ritual. Prayerless prayers, praiseless praise, and faithless faith. And sometimes it gets worse. Proverbs 26 says, like a coating of glaze over earthenware, a fervent lips with an evil heart. It's a nice looking, shiny, glazed vase. But before it's glazed and painted, it's pretty dull looking. There's not much to it. What this can be covering up and looking nice on the outside is things like pride. Which, by the way, if you're looking for the source of any and all sin, that's it. That's number one. Sin requires that you put yourself in what you want first, because if you were putting what God wanted first, you wouldn't do it. So in that moment, at least, pride has opened the door to sin. When you forget for a moment who's who, who you are and who God is, pride opens the door and says, here we go. Hypocrisy. Someone uh, said that they didn't think it was accurate 
I heard this years ago, to just say, well, you know, you say you're a great person and all that stuff, or you have this, this image, but, you know, you do all kinds of stuff. Well, there are people who do some things that they shouldn't do because they made a mistake, not because they don't intend to do the right thing. If you're a hypocrite, he said, it's, you'll tell people, other people, these things are important, but you don't really believe they are, which is why you live the kind of life you do. Hypocrisy, by the way, I believe, is a, is a, a violation of the commandment that says don't take the, Lord, the Lord's name in vain. If you're supposed to be a follower of his and you don't behave that way, you're misrepresenting him. Insincerity. You're in here, you're doing your thing, you're out and about. Oh, yeah, so-and-so's a, a Christian, so-and-so gives to the church, so-and-so. Um, you know, you see them around and everything, and uh, they say they believe in God, but they don't really have anything behind that. It doesn't mean anything to them. Or even worse, they think they have it so well together that they fall into self-righteousness. And because they're so awesome, they feel like they can kind of lay that out on everybody else. I've been to churches where you could cut the self-righteousness with a knife when you walk in. Every one of these things can be found in any church in Christianity around the world today, this very morning. Don't kid yourself. Sometimes it looks like this on the outside, but it's a lot more like this on the inside. There's not really anything there. And in fact, there are people that can be doing more harm than good. Something to watch out for? You bet. But like uh, the church in, in uh, Revelation, let's not forget why we're really here in the first place. So, Matthew 18 says this, At that time the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Well, knowing better as we do, we already know they're in trouble asking this question, right? He called a child and had him stand among them and said, I tell you the truth, unless you turn around and become like little children... You will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever then humbles himself like this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes a child like this in my name welcomes me. So, greatness is found in those who can humble themselves like a child. Now, did that mean is because, well, they're not an adult yet. They don't really have anything going on. They don't have any resources. They don't have any money. They're not any kind of a big shot. So they don't have anything to be all proud about. So, you know, that's not actually it. What are some childlike qualities? A trusting heart. They depend on you to show them the way to go, to take care of them. You're someone that can be believed so they have a receptive attitude. I'm here to learn. I'm here for you to tell me what I'm supposed to do. I need that. I can't figure it out for myself. And the dependent nature, they depend on you for their very survival, for their education, for their progress. Is this how we see God? That's the childlike attitude Jesus is talking about. Because the Father seeks such people to be his worshipers. So when we talk about spirit and truth, what are we really talking about? For one thing, sincerity. Either God really means something to you, on a daily basis, in every aspect of your life, or he doesn't. Because if that's not the case, how is worship going to be sincere? How is it going to be spirit-filled? How is it going to be true? You'd be surprised how many Christians you talk to, and it seems like they don't take God seriously at all. Can you do? Pray for him. Pray for yourself to make sure you don't fall into that. Heartfelt and loving. We know how we feel about our loved ones, our family, our children, our relatives, our close friends. Why it breaks our heart to lose them. Do we love God that much? Is he that important to us? Is our worship biblical? I've heard about some pretty crazy things going on in at least nominally Christian churches today. Our function as the body of Christ has, has to follow biblical instructions. Our worship has to be biblical. Are we influenced by the Holy Spirit of God? Believers are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, but do we listen to him? doesn't shout at us. If we're not paying attention, we won't hear it. We have to quiet down and listen. What is the Spirit? Does the Spirit influence us and direct us? Or are we just going our own way all day? So that's why it says the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, not spirit or truth. Why? Because spirit without truth is shallow and emotional. 
Truth without spirit is dry, joyless, and unfeeling. There are folks who are off the wall emotionally for Jesus. They don't know that much about him. They're not interested in learning that much about him. It's great that they love him, but the first time a little wind comes along, they're knocked off their feet. I know other people who are biblical experts, but boy, they sure don't seem terribly excited about God. Are they doing what the church is doing, getting so wrapped up in other parts of it that they're forgetting about him? The, both, both these extremes, you're missing out. You're missing out on growing stronger in your faith. You're missing out on an opportunity to share what's so exciting to you with other people so they can see that. When Deuteronomy 6.5 says, you must love the Lord your God with your whole mind, your whole being, and all your strength, it doesn't say, oh, I need to really, really love God as hard as I can. What it means is spirit without truth is shallow and emotional. Truth without spirit is dry, joyless, and unfeeling. You need a complete commitment of yourself to God. So the true worshipers that we keep talking about have a few things. For one thing, they have faith. You take this seriously. You really believe it. You don't just get knocked off course by any little thing that comes along or any little time you don't get your way or any time something doesn't make sense to you quite right away. You believe it hard. You're willing to fight for it. You're willing to say no when doubt comes along. I choose not to fall for that. I know what Christ means to me, and I'm not letting go. In fact, when I start feeling doubtful, I'm going to grab on tighter. So there, devil, take that. The true worshiper seeks to get closer. If you're so excited about God and you want to learn more about him and you love him so much, I would think we'd be reaching out for him closer and closer, as close as we could, day after day after day, because we can't get enough of him. A true worshiper commits fully. you got to be all in. The other thing you said in Revelation, you're lukewarm, I'd rather you were hot or cold, make up your mind, commit. You're a follower, you're a true worshiper of Christ, or you're not. And as a result, a true worshiper experiences change. If you've really encountered Christ, and if you really love him, and you really want to learn more about him, how can you not change? How can that not affect you? So when we look at Romans 12, we see this, Therefore I exhort you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a sacrifice, alive, holy, and pleasing to God, which is your reasonable service. Go all in. Do not be conformed to this present world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That daily sanctification, that change that you should be experiencing so that you may test and approve what is the will of God, what is good and well-pleasing and perfect. What does this look like? What does it feel like? Let's look at Psalm 63. Oh God, you are my God, I long for you. My soul thirsts for you, my flesh yearns for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. Yes, in the sanctuary I have seen you and witnessed your power and splendor because experiencing your loyal love is better than life itself. My lips will praise you. God, you are my God, I long for you. I can't get enough of you. I want to know more of you. I want to experience you. I'm going to keep reaching out and grabbing for you as much as I possibly can, no matter what happens, no matter what's going on with me. My soul thirsts for you. It's a basic need. My flesh yearns for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water except for the living water of Christ. That's the water there is that will nourish you. Yes, in the sanctuary I have seen you and witnessed your power and splendor. Have we not experienced what God has done for us? If you can sit there as part of the body of Christ and say, God's never done anything for me that I can think of, there's a problem. We need to talk. You cannot tell me God has not worked in your life one way or the other. It shouldn't be hard to think of things that God has done to benefit you. Sometimes it didn't feel like it at the time. Then you realize it later, wow, that was for my own good. Do you even think about that? Because experience your loyal love is better than life itself. There's nothing more important, which is why... Our lips will praise him, which is why here we are to worship. Recall what God has done in your life to help keep you on track. When the devil wants to knock you off to the side, you know, I know what God has done for me. And you think back, one of my favorite things to look back on is the day I got knocked off my spiritual horse and got saved. Because I had a very Paul-like experience. It was very sudden for me. And one of my favorite things to do when doubt tries to creep in is I go back to that day because I know what happened that day. I know that I realized who Christ really was. As many times as I'd heard that name over the years, now I suddenly, all at once, it was like somebody stuck it in my head. I really knew who he was. And I committed that day that I would never turn my back on him again. But then I realized something important. I had just been changed. 
And it made me look back on everything I had said and done. And I said, before we go a step further, I owe you an apology. I've been wrong, and I need to be forgiven. And I have never looked back. Trust God deeply. There are so few things you can trust in. There are so few people you can say 100% I can trust. God is the one. Why do you not trust him completely? Resist doubt. Doubt is not something you want to be in a constant battle with. You make a choice. You say, I'm not having it. I know who Christ is, and I'm just going to, you can try to knock me off course all you want, knock me off the chair. I'm just going to go right over whatever obstacle you put in front of me because I'm not letting go of my Savior. And be thankful no matter how hard life gets. I'm quite sure if you look hard enough, you shouldn't have to look very hard to be thankful for things God has done for you, for the fact that you even exist. For the fact that for whatever reason, it's one of my biggest curiosities, God decides that I'm going to show myself to you. You get to be saved. Uh, any particular reason that, that was me? Uh, we don't know. But we don't need to know. We just need to appreciate it. And after all we've been forgiven for, if we can't forgive, we have a huge problem. We must. Another choice we must make, no matter how difficult it is, is to forgive as we've been forgiven. So with all of this, we can mature in the Christian life and get stronger and help others to get stronger. Why? So we can exemplify the joy and peace of Jesus everywhere we go. So that everywhere we go and everything we do, people look at us and see him. They need to look at us and see him. So that everything we do can and should be worship, and it should be in spirit and truth. Brick after brick, God is building his temple. Brick after brick. Christ is your foundation and his people